Hello, I'm Jim Richards. I want to welcome you to this week's broadcast. You know, we're going to be talking about, I, I really thought about calling this the myth of the crucified life, but I was afraid if some people read that title, they, they wouldn't get it. They'd turn me off first. Because you see, most of what we've been taught about the crucified life is a myth. If you are buying into suffering and and, and going through pain, I got news for you. Jesus already went through all the suffering and all the pain. You don't have to go through it, and you don't need to be hanging on a cross and trying to crucify yourself. You need to be enjoying the resurrected life because that's really what it's all about. If you're crucified with Christ, then, you're, then you can be raised up with him right now in this life. You can enjoy the resurrection life, which means whatever's going on with Jesus is what's going to be going on with you. Man, this is one of those that you're going to want to share with everybody. And, of course, this is one of those that we're going to great detail in the series that we can't go into here. But I'm going to tell you something. There's going to be enough meat on these bones here that you can feed yourself for a mighty long time. You're going to get so much out of this new series. It's called Communing with Christ, Experiencing the Power of the Cross. You know, the Apostle Paul said the power of the cross was a mystery. In other words, it's a secret that's hidden out in the open. And we talk about the cross. We hear people say things about the cross. But the truth is not many people have any concept of communing with Jesus at the cross where we share in his death, his burial, and the resurrected life. Be sure and get it. You know, one of the myths of Christianity is the way we teach and understand the crucified life. Now, I believe in the crucified life. Don't get me wrong. I believe the Bible teaches the crucified life, but just like so many aspects of our faith, just like so many aspects of our Christianity, culture and religion has taught us something about the crucified life that is totally uh, alien to the New Testament concept of how we're really supposed to live. Because you see, for most people, living the crucified life means living in pain, living in suffering, doing without. I got news for you. You know, if we ever have to suffer for righteousness sake, then so be it. If we ever have to suffer because of the call of Christ so that we can go out and win thousands or millions of people to Jesus, then so be it. But I got news for you. Most of the suffering that we do is our own ignorance, it's our own disobedience, it's our own foolishness, it's our own... Uh, refusal to, to follow God, even though we're dedicated, fully dedicated. But I'll tell you something, the crucified life is not what we've been taught. I'll never forget there was a guy, that, a minister, I greatly respect it. Man, he'd been in the ministry many more years than I had. And, and we were doing a television program together. And, and I started talking about the crucified life from this perspective. And I'm telling you, we, we, had a, we had a revival right there. And after the interview was over, we talked at length. We went out to lunch and talked at length about the crucified life. I got news for you. In the crucified life, all that needs to die is your old man. Your, uh, in other words, any aspect of you outside of Jesus. It's not the death to your dreams. Man, I've, I've heard that stuff taught, that you got to let your dreams die. you got to let your goals die. No, let me tell you something. You know, God puts so many of those dreams in your heart, and even if God doesn't put them in your heart, God is usually okay with your dreams being fulfilled as long as they're being fulfilled in a godly way. The main thing that's got to die about our dreams sometimes is the selfish ways uh, that we're going to try to bring them to pass, or sometimes uh, the, the, the vain attempts at feeding our ego. You know, that kind of stuff is destructive, but I got news for you. God wants you to live your dreams. It's a, it's a healthy thing to live your dreams. Today we're going to talk about the crucified life reveal. What does it really mean to live a crucified life? And as we said, you know, the, the religious version of the crucified life is, is just something that's horrible, that's painful, and it's all about suffering. Listen, always remember this. Religion wants you to believe that you have to suffer so that you can become righteous because they think that suffering or they teach that suffering purges you of your sin. I want you to realize if Jesus at the cross did not purge us of our sin, then there's nothing that we can do to add to that. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul teaches in the book of Galatians that attempting to add anything to the finished work of Jesus is tantamount to rejecting the cross of Christ. I want to tell you something. 
We live impotent lives. We live lives where there's not victory. We live lives of struggling and suffering so many times just because of ignorant religious beliefs that have been passed down for, for centuries. I mean, we have been told things that are just not even remotely based on new covenant realities. And the crucified life, again, I believe in the crucified life, but today you're going to understand more about the crucified life. Let's look at some scriptures about the crucified life, just so, just so you get this. You know, Paul says in Romans 6, 6, Our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. So the first thing the crucified life means is I am free from the power of sin. I have died to sin. Sin has absolutely no power over me. Now, I got news for you. Whether you know it or not, the only time we sin is when we want to. It's never because we have to. We, we do it because we're seeking to gratify ourselves in some way because we don't believe that God can meet that need. We don't trust God to, to really, really meet that, meet that need. So the, the key thing about the crucified life, I'm free from sin. But remember, sin is any sense of myself, any belief, or any behavior that is less than who God says I am. It's not about how evil I am or how wicked I am. It's about the fact that I am not living as I should be. See, righteousness, the word righteous in the original language means as it should be or as you should be. So righteousness is when you're as you should be, the way that God says you are. Sin is when you believe and live at any standard of living that's less than how you could be or should be through the death, burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Man, I'm going to tell you something. If that doesn't give you freedom, if that doesn't make you look at life differently, I don't know if anything will. God wants you to feel good about yourself. God wants you to recognize, like we talked about in my series, Dignity and Worth. God wants you to recognize that you, you, you have the glory of God. Jesus said the glory that the Father's given me, I give to you. We are believers. We, we are the glory of God here in planet Earth. When we yield to the Spirit of God, when we live in resurrection life, the glory of God is manifest to the world around us because they see people walking with God, knowing God. Galatians 6.14 says this, God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So again, we see the crucified life, number one, being separated from the world, and specifically when it talks about the world, it's talking about the world system. I want to tell you something. I am so glad to be free from the world system. Man, when I look at the mess that politics is in, when I look at the mess that most of the church world is in, when I look at the games that people play, you know, sometimes my, you know, uh, my wife and I'll be laying in bed watching television, and, and 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 they're glorifying people who are cheating on their spouses. They're they're making you be sympathetic for the person who's the criminal or or the deviant. And, and I tell you, in my heart, I, in my heart, I, I'm just thank you, Father, that I don't live in that world. Or you see these movies, or you are in counseling, you meet these people that that are just cutthroat, and, and everything is about trying to one-up somebody else. And you think, man, I am freed from that system. And see, what frees me from that system is that my old man is dead. And we're going to talk about the old man. What is the old man? What does that really mean? Well, matter of fact, let's just talk about it now. What is, see, most people, when they, if they even have any concept of, of the old man, that's the concept of this is who I was before I came to Jesus. Now, that's true, and that's part of it. But in reality, the old man is not something that is before a certain timeline, and the new man is not something that's after a timeline. It's not about a timeline. The old man is the way you believed about yourself outside of Christ. So you can be a believer and be yielding to the old man. Because the old man operated in the laws of the world. The old man operated in the flesh. The old man operated in these in these. Uh, deadly principles that alienate you from the life of God. And so the old man is any aspect of who you think you are outside of Jesus. The new man is who you are in Jesus, who you are with Christ in you and you in him and him in God and you and 
God and the Lord Jesus Christ being one and the Holy Spirit. I, I'm telling you, it's, it's a whole new world is, it, is really what it is. You know, Galatians 2.20, one of my favorite scriptures says, I've, I have been, past tense, I have been. Why? At the cross of Christ, the Bible says in Isaiah 53 that God made the iniquity of us all to rush violently upon Jesus. It says that, it says that he was wounded for my transgressions. He, he was bruised for my iniquity. The chastisement for my peace was upon him. And that word for chastisement is not the word to child train like the child that you value. That's the word chastisement in the Hebrew that, means, that really does mean to punish or to afflict. You see, he had punishment and affliction so that I could have peace. Why does that give me peace? Because I know that God will never afflict or punish me for, for, for sin because Jesus has already paid for that sin. God the Father would be denying the cross of Christ if he punished me again for something that Jesus had already taken punishment for. Uh, uh, man, a lot. how incredible is the love of God? He says, I am crucified with Christ, past tense. Every part of me outside of Jesus died. Every part of me that needed punishment or suffering, Jesus took that for me so that I don't have to take it so I can live in peace. He says, so since that old man died, it's no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. So it's like, whoa, now... Through he's starting to get into the concept of resurrection life, which is really where we're going. Christ lives in me. I, I, I see, I live a new life that's based on the resurrected Jesus, not just based on the crucified Jesus. But then he says something real interesting. He says, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So the crucified life really means that I get to be free from the worst part of who I've ever been, the worst part of who I am, the worst part of, uh, uh, of me. And because I'm raised up in Jesus, I'm not a, you know, I'm, I'm a new person, but I'm not a different person. I'm still Jim Richards. But you know what? In Christ, we have the opportunity to be the best version of us. You have the opportunity to be the best version of you that you could ever be because you're in Jesus and the grace of God is working in you, empowering you to live a godly life, to, to be the new man, to walk in the Spirit, to, to trust God, to manifest the Holy Spirit to the world around you. Oh, man, I love Christ in me. Me and him, us and God together. Oh, boy, I'm telling you what you can. It, it doesn't get any better than that. So when you start talking about the crucified life, I want you to realize anyone that talks to you about the crucified life, independent of talking to you about the resurrected life, is really going to either intentionally or unintentionally lead you into the concept that you need to be suffering. And Jesus suffered so that we don't have to suffer. He suffered once for all. Nobody has to suffer. Now, now understand something. There will be a day that every believer will stand before Jesus and receive rewards for how we lived in this life. And when you stand before Jesus, you're not going to be there. You're not going to be there uh, reviewing all your sins and failures. All of your failures pass through the fire. They're never seen. They're never go before the presence of the king. But whatever you have done for a right motive, for a godly motive, you get a reward for it. So for those people who act like it doesn't matter how you live in this life, they evidently have no concept of the fact that we're going to all stand before uh, the judgment seat of Christ where we receive our reward. Everyone who chooses to reject Jesus, according to the Bible, is going to stand before God at the great white throne judgment, and they're going to be judged by their works. Now, that's just the way it is. Like it, don't like it. It doesn't fit with your philosophy of God or your doctrine of grace or whatever it is that, 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 that you're trying to perpetuate. That's the Bible. The Bible is the Word of God, and that's the only way we can understand God. There is no need for you to... Uh, try to live the crucified life beyond putting off the old man. And I'm telling you, next week we're going to get into the most functional, the most practical aspect of this. 
putting off the old man is where we enter into the crucified life. Putting off the old man is really as simple as sending the old man away. I don't choose this. I don't want this. You have no power over me. You, you can't be here. But you see, if we stay there with the crucified life, that's sort of like wearing a crucifix. You know, and I'm not trying to knock people that wear a crucifix. But you know, my thing is this. Jesus isn't still on the cross. Jesus came off that cross, he went to a tomb, and he was raised from the dead. The cross is empty and the tomb is empty, but I got news for you. The throne at the right hand of God is not empty. That is where Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. And you know what? You're in him, and the Bible says we are seated with him in heavenly places. So I got news for you. No teaching about the crucifixion without teaching about the resurrection life. You see, the Apostle Paul really wanted people to understand this. The book of Ephesians is such an incredible book. You know, Ephesians is one of those books that talks about the eternal purposes of God. Ephesians is one of those books that helps you understand the de kinds of decisions that God made really before, before heaven and earth, before eternity. Ephesians is one of those books where you understand the foundation of all things. And the Apostle Paul here in Ephesians 1.17, he, he says he's praying for you that the God of our Father, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. And I, and I like that. He's the Father of glory. Now remember, the, the glory is the brightness, the splendor, the greatness, uh, the majesty, all these things. But it's also the view, the opinion, the reality. You see, God has a view and opinion of you now that you're in Jesus. That view and opinion of you is a spiritual reality, and you can step into that spiritual reality anytime you want to, but this happens as you commune with Christ. You see, we haven't even gotten into this whole concept of communion with Christ. See, to commune, or the word communion, means to share something in common. Well, the primary thing that we share in common with Jesus, more than anything else, is the cross, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And that's the place that we go to. And, and at that place, that's where we connect with the glory of God. That's where we connect with the view, the opinion, and the reality of God. And the, this reality is what glorifies God all through eternity. You see, whenever, whenever we look at the cross and, com, and experience the, the death of our old man, experience the resurrection of our new man, the Bible says that in this, we're teaching the angels uh, uh, the, the glory of God. They are, they're seeing the wisdom of God in what happens to men who unite with God around the cross of Christ. And by the cross of Christ, I mean the place of his death, burial, and resurrection. And that becomes your living reality. So, so God is not only the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, but he's also the Father of glory. I want God's opinion of me to become my opinion. I want God's opinion of you to become your opinion. I want the way God sees me to become how I see me. As a matter of fact, I want the way God sees you to become the way that I see you. I tell you, we treat one, one another differently if we saw each other the way God sees us. He says, and he says he's praying that he will give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge. Now, remember the word wisdom is practical application. A revelation is when you, is when you, there is something that's been there all the time. It's not just coming. See, it's here. God's trying to show us this. And a revelation comes when we remove that which has us blinded. And one of the primary things that has us blinded is the law. You know, in the book of Corinthians, Paul talks about being changed from glory to glory. And, and he talks about how, that, how this veil, which it represents the law, as long as this is over our eyes and we think there's righteousness by, by obeying the law. Let me tell you something. I, I believe in the law. I believe the law is God's wisdom. It's his standard of morality. I believe it teaches us uh, how to function in life. But it doesn't make me righteous. And the truth is, if I, if I get focused on trying to obey the law, I'm going to get in what the Bible calls the flesh, and this is not going to work very well. It's going to alienate me. But if I keep looking to Christ in me, if I, and if I look at and, and experience the power of the Holy Spirit, then I'm going to automatically fulfill the law, the requirements of the law, without ever even looking at it. What a paradox, man, I love. So he says, so, so there's, so, but we got to take this veil off of our eyes about works righteousness and religion and all this stuff. And, and he says, 
that, that he, he wants you to have the spirit of wisdom, practical application, revelation, removing the veil, and the knowledge of him. And that word knowledge comes from that Greek word gnosis, which has to do with experiencing something with every fiber of your being. Experience something with every capacity that you have to experience. Now listen to this. He says that your, the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened that you might know, and he gives you three things that he wants you to know. First of all, what is the hope of his calling? You notice he doesn't say, I want you to know what's the hope of your calling. Man, I tell you, I get, I get sick of these people talking about their calling. I get sick of these people. I'm an apostle. I'm a prophet. I'm this. I'm that. Let me tell you something. It's all right that you might function in a particular office. I'm not critical of that, but I got news for you. I want to share in his calling, and if we are in him, we share in his calling, and no matter what office you function in, you function at an office to fulfill his calling, not to fulfill your calling. He says, I want you to know the confident expectation of his calling. We have, we, we have a reason to really expect something because we are called to the same thing he's called to. And this does, isn't just a ministry calling. This is what are we called to as an inheritance? What are we called to in eternal life? I got news for you. Everything that Jesus is called to, you're called to. And you know what he's not called to? He's not called to the curse of the law. That's why Galatians 3.13 says you're redeemed from the curse of the law. You should never accept anything that's a curse of the law. Coloss I mean, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 1.20 says every promise God has made to anybody is yes to you because you're in Jesus. So you're called to this inheritance of all the promises that God ever made to anybody, including the ones he made to Jesus. Man alive, the hope of his calling. And he says, I want you to know what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance. In other words, I'm not focusing on what kind of inheritance I'm going to get. I'm focusing on what kind of inheritance he got at the resurrection. And then he really wraps it up in this. In verse 19, he says, and I want you to, you've got to see what is exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places far above all principality, power, and dominion, and every name that's named, not only in this age, but also in that which is come. In other words, Paul says the primary thing you got to know is, is what you have in him through his calling and his inheritance. But you've also got to know that the very power that raised Jesus from the dead, just think about it. Man, Jesus is laying in a tomb in the darkness, if you will, in the belly of the earth and wrapped around him. And, and you know, Samson was a type of Jesus. Samson was in, man, he was, he was in uh, pushing a millstone. He was blinded. He was chained. And, and this is a type of Jesus dying and being dead in sin. But you know what? The Spirit of the Lord came on Samson. When he did, man, he popped those chains off and he defeated the enemy. Well, I got news for you. That's just, that's just a small inkling of what happened. When the Spirit of God moved upon Jesus, he broke the power of every sin and every temptation that you have ever had and that you ever will have. That means, just like Romans 6, 14, no temptation or no sin of any kind has lordship over you because you're not under law, you're under grace. Man alive, resurrection alive. See, I don't understand the crucified life and I haven't even accepted the crucified life if I haven't accepted the resurrection life. You see, accepting the crucified life without accepting the resurrection life is like saying, I'm just gonna lay in the tomb. Uh, you know, I died, but there's no resurrection. There's no victory. God wants, you to, God wants you to be as victorious in this life as Jesus is right now through the resurrection. And I'll tell you, not only did he come up and receive an inheritance that included all the promises of God, he totally stripped the devil of all power, of all authority and all might. Listen, this stuff about the devil having authority and power and all that kind of stuff, that's a bunch of religious hooey. I got news for you. Jesus is not afraid of the devil. That means you don't have to be afraid of the devil. Jesus is not trying not begging God for, for a healing. Healing is His in resurrection life. The Bible says that the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal body. Let me tell you something. Until resurrection life is your standard, then your standards are just too low. Until all the promises of God, you're going to lay hold to them. Even if you're not experiencing them, you're going to say, no, you know what? These are mine. Let the weak say they're strong. Let the poor say I'm rich. In other words, no matter where you are, you say, you know what? I might be experiencing this now, but I got news for you. The resurrection life is mine. These promises are mine. That's when 
that's when the crucified life makes sense. It makes sense because I put off the poor. I put off the weak. I put off the sick. I put off the sinful. I put off the liar. I put off every way I experience life outside of Christ. Listen, don't go away. I'm going to come back in just a minute. And I'm going to talk to you about uh, our mentoring moment and what you can do to start applying this right now. But I'll tell you what, you want to be sure and get this series because I'm going to go into information in these series, and I'm going to include in this a free heart physics meditation. You know, all over the world, people are listening to this program, this CD, reading books, taking Bible school courses. Right now, Impact Ministries is involved in reaching one billion people around the world with a message of grace, faith righteousness, and the unconditional love of God. And the, and the amazing thing is we, we're touching these people's lives and they're not losing touch with winning the lost. They're, they're still winning the lost. They're still laying hands on the sick. They're still seeing miracles. You see, we believe it's all for us and it's all for today. And you know what this happens through our world changer family. World changers are people who say, you know something? We believe that if the world hears the truth, they'll want God. See. The real reason the world doesn't want God according to the Bible is because of what they've heard. Isaiah 52 tells us the whole world's blaspheming because of what they've heard. Become a world changer and help us change the way the world sees God. This new series that I have, Communion with Christ, Experiencing the Power of the Cross, is just a phenomenal series. It's going to be one of these that you're going to listen to over and over and over again. It's going to change the way you pray. It's going to change the way you think. It's going to be changing the way you approach every aspect of life. And in this phenomenal series, you're going to be receiving a free heart physics exercise that will help you go to that place of the cross, connect with Christ, and experience the power of the cross. You know, when we begin to relate to the cross properly, the death, burial, and resurrection, we start realizing that every problem that we have, we have to face that problem in light of what Jesus did at the cross. So when something destructive comes into your life, there's one thing that you want to do. You want to say, is this a curse of the law? Galatians 3.13 says, I am redeemed from the curse of the law. And then, and I do this out loud. When something comes into my life that's based on the curse of the law, out loud I say, I do not accept you. You are not from God. I don't need you. I don't want you. I am freed from you by the cross of Christ. I send you away. And that's the first half of really putting off the old man, if you will, and putting on the new man. And then the second thing that I want to do is this. I want to ask myself this question. Whatever it is that I'm facing right now, whatever it is I'm feeling right now, whatever it is I'm going through right now, is Jesus having to face this and deal with this at the right hand of God? In other words, is Jesus depressed right now? Is Jesus sad right now? Is Jesus worried right now? Is Jesus broke right now? And at, you know, and, and then you know what the answer is going to be. But at that point, I have to say, I am in Christ Jesus, seated at the right hand of God. All He has is mine, and I lay hold to right now. And then whatever promise of God. And it's really important. You know, if you got my prayer, prayer organizer, you know at least 200 or 220 of the promises of God. And you can immediately go to a scripture that shows you that, that whatever you need is yours in Jesus. If not, you just go through the Bible and every time it makes a promise to anybody, underline it, uh, highlight it, and make sure you can come back to it. But there's got to be that place where you make your own choice. I send away that which is related to the curse, and I choose that which is related to the resurrection.